Hi, this is Mr. Curtis, and today what I would like to talk to you about is critical thinking, especially in science. Critical thinking is looking at a situation, taking in all of the information, and coming up with a reasonable conclusion based on what you see. That's really a hard thing to do, and that's one of the things that we're going to be working on throughout the entire year. Some steps to critical thinking. Start first by relying on your previous knowledge. What have you learned about it before? What things have you done in the past that you can use as, your, as an experience for the situation now? Review all the relevant information. So if you're doing something on cooking, for example, you're not going to be studying um, moon and rock samples or something like that. Two completely different things. You should use only the information that's relevant to what you're talking about. And lastly, keep an open mind. That's probably the hardest thing to do. And we'll talk about each of these three. So relying on previous knowledge. Now, if you look at this photo, you can see here are some marks on the road. It looks like the marks continue through here into the vegetation on the side. Uh, I'll bet there is probably some more munching and scrunching of stuff there. Well, anyone who uh, can make a pretty good guess realizes, yeah, the car skidded off the road there. And the other thing is, you see how this road is curvy? Yeah, somebody will my guess is somebody was probably going too fast for the conditions and went off the road. Um, this I found is an interesting chart. This shows uh, how far a skid mark will be based on your speed. For example, over here, 40 miles an hour, you follow that across, you can guess that right about there. So it looks to be like maybe 65 feet. If you're going 40 miles an hour, your the length of the mark will be 65 feet. Ain't that something? Okay, so kind of a sad picture here. Ferrari that took it on the chin, literally, but you can see how the hood has been smushed and there's uh, the, the horsey there is, is busted and here's some other stuff here. So we can pretty much guess that this was a fender bender. But what I would like you to do is to compare this photo and the next photo and tell me which one the Ferrari was traveling faster. Ew, that one's kind of grisly, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, this one, I think you could probably say it's going slower and this one faster. So again, you're using your previous knowledge. All right, now here's a picture of a mailbox and you're probably thinking, Mr. Curtis, what are you talking about mailboxes for? Well, okay, look at this for example. There's a spot here where the grass is not growing. Well, what's causing that? Well, anyone who lives out in the country knows that it gets delivered, your mail gets delivered by a car, and every day you've got the car that goes along here. So you can probably assume, even though we weren't there, that a car made those marks and left those marks. Now, how about this? What caused the mailbox to be pushed over? Well, it could be a lot of things. You notice that there's some water right there. So maybe the ground is especially wet and where it was staked in, the, the ground is softened and now it's flipped over. That's a possibility. We weren't there, so we don't know necessarily. But let's look a little closer here. You see these tire marks here and here and if you look real closely there's some tire marks right here so another possibility might be that somebody was driving in or out and got a little too close and smushed the mailbox how about this well this we have to look forward to in the next couple months obviously you've got fresh snow here and notice how the snow is not nice and even we know that that would be a snow plow that came along so if I had to guess, yeah, probably a snowplow got too close and took out the mailbox. I'm sure some of you have had that happen to you. This I thought was pretty funny. This is one dude's 
solution to having snowplow issues. Look at that. He He's just made a, a big thing of concrete, put concrete all around his mailbox. See, you just go ahead and try to break my mailbox now, Mr. Snowplow. Here's an ingenious guy's uh, invention, how to deal with the snowplow. I thought that was kind of funny. And here. All right, so you have a tree that's fallen. But here you can see that it's completely nice and smooth. It's not fractured. If you look back over here, you can see how the tree is kind of broken and fractured in pieces. So that tells me that this has been cut. And then you've got a piece here off to the side. Well, that's pretty easy. We could probably deduce from our previous knowledge that, yeah, the tree fell on the mailbox. How about this? Well, it could be a lot of things. Something hit it, something came along, ran into it, who knows. However, if I had to guess, it probably would have been something like this, where somebody took a baseball bat or whatever to it. By the way, destroying a mailbox may sound like something simple, but it's actually a felony. A felony is a type of crime that is a major crime. So it's not just a little mis misdemeanor uh, little crime. This is a big crime. So smashing, smashing mailboxes is not a good thing. And all of this kind of logical uh, reasoning and looking at things, this is exactly what shows like CSI and actual crime scene investigations and even fire investigations. All of those things you have to rely on previous knowledge, previous information, looking at the facts and coming up with a conclusion. This is why the three things that need to be done with your information are to verify, verify, and verify. Yes, that's the three things that you need to do with information. What does it mean to verify? Well, verify means to make sure something is accurate. Accurate, yes, accurate, true, reliable. That's what accurate means. All right. So, dude, just like Zeus says, you got to check the facts. And facts, we have a lot of talk about facts these days, truths and so on. Uh, but undeniable facts, I always think of these are the ones that most people, most people agree upon. Now, you notice I say most people, because no matter what the issue is, you're always going to get some people that aren't going to agree with the facts. There are people from the Flat Earth Society believing that the Earth is still flat. You have people that believe that the moon launches in the 1960s and early 70s. That was all fake, done on some Hollywood lot, and it was, uh, you know, it was all special effects. It really didn't happen. So... You know, those are the kinds of things that people, most people will agree upon, but there's always some people that won't. Now, claimed results, claimed results are things based on research. Research is done, and from there, information is gathered, and from that, then you come up with a conclusion. So you hear this all the time in the news about this person's research and this person's research. And that's uh, these claimed results based on research, those are the ones that uh, I would like to spend most of our time with critical thinking about. So research-based stuff. Number one, uh, research-based has to be public information. It has to be put out there in the public for everyone to read and to look at. It can't be something closed in where you only, it's only believed by a, a certain group, but it has to be looked at by a whole bunch of people. And the most important thing, uh, number two, research that can be peer reviewed. 
In other words, others can look at it. It's got to be something that's brought out into the public and everyone gets to see what you've done. Think of it as like you are opening a restaurant. If you open a restaurant and you say, hey, I've got the best food in the world, but you never let anybody taste it, how do you know that you have the best food in the world? You've got to open it up for critics to see, look at, and so on. So it's kind of the same thing here when we're talking about data and peer-reviewed information. Because if you don't, these are some examples that can happen where things did not get peer-reviewed. Now, uh, here's two gentlemen. They were scientists from Utah, and in 1989, yeah, I know, a long time ago, they came out with the idea of something called cold fusion. Cold fusion was going to be a way to solve everyone's energy problems. All of a sudden, by having cold fusion, they thought that this device that they had created, it kind of looks like a light bulb, goofy looking light bulb, but this was going to solve all the world's energy problems. They said that by cold fusion, you would only have to fill up your car once in a lifetime. You imagine only filling your car up one time, driving it for decades and never having to get gasoline again? That's what they were saying this was going to be. Because before their proponents of cold, this idea of cold fusion, fusion was only something that can happen at super, super high temperatures, like in the sun. You take two pieces of hydrogen, they combine, and they form helium, and in the process, you get a tremendous amount of energy that's made. And this is the same thing with some uh, thermonuclear bombs. It's the same thing. But that only happens at millions and millions of degrees, rather than something at like room temperature. Well, sure enough, a little while later, it was found that this cold fusion was just a bunch of baloney. That they, they didn't let the information be peer reviewed. Nobody could repeat the results. And that was the issue, all gone. Now, more recently, a guy by the name of Andrew Wakefield, he came up with research that said that vaccines, shots, vaccines would cause autism. Autism is a condition that many of you uh, are familiar with. You've, uh, you know people that have autism. And uh, he said that he had research to show that this, in fact, showed that um, vaccines caused autism. Well, a lot of people became very, very uh, outraged and upset about this. And even some famous people, like uh, Jenny McCarthy, who is a famous actress, she wrote this book. It says, Healing and Preventing Autisms. She claimed that you could prevent autism. Wow. So a lot of people thought, wow, this would be great if you could do that. Well, guess what? It turned out to be completely untrue. Evidence shows vaccines unrelated to autisms. In other words, vaccines do not cause autism. And in fact, papers were produced, published, that said uh, this man's results, but then they had to be retracted. They had to be restated, re returned. Nope, sorry, we goofed up. It had nothing to do with it. We were wrong. And in fact, this dude, uh, Wakefield, had to uh, apologize. It turned out it was an elaborate fraud. He had faked his lab results really really bad stuff so it's always always good to review verify and verify now lastly keeping an open mind this is super hard to do because we all have our own little belief systems that it must be this otherwise this can't happen and so to reject your own original thought and keep an open mind that's super hard Imagine in 1905 when Einstein came up with this idea that time changes. Time is relative, that it can change. Wow. I mean, how could that happen? But he turned out to be correct. 
And then another thing that Einstein figured out, that gravity, like that from the sun, what gravity actually is, is a bend in space and time. That gravity bends space and time. That was a huge, crazy idea that Einstein came up with. Guess what? Turned out to be correct. So keeping an open mind is really, really hard. Now, lastly, what I would like to do, I'd like to leave you with some quotes from somebody who you probably don't know, but from my generation. His name was Mr. Spock from Star Trek, and he has some pretty interesting quotes here. And this last quote uh, talks about something, I'll just put this down right now, talks about the impossible. And actually, this quote he stole from somebody else. He says, a, he says a previous ancestor. That ancestor is a famous person. And the first person who comes up with whom Mr. Spock stole that quote from, I will give you a candy bar. So, we'll talk to you later. I am half Balkanian. Balkanians do not speculate. I speak from pure logic. If I let go of a hammer on a planet that has a positive gravity, I need not see it fall to know that it has, in fact, fallen. Predictably metaphysical. I prefer the concrete, the graspable, the provable. An ancestor of mine maintained that if you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. <laughs>